So this is the beginning of a lecture series on uh, thermodynamics uh, phase and phase diagrams. Uh, we're going to start by talking about some definitions. And what I hope you'll find is that the you know, fundamental concepts of thermodynamics are actually pretty simple. And the, the real trick of applying the principles of thermodynamics is mostly about being careful about bookkeeping and uh, I guess being able to, to represent the system that you want to uh, work with properly. And for me, this is mostly about drawing pictures and drawing boxes around things. And let me show you what I mean by that. So we define our system as the region of space that we're interested in. And you know, universe. By that, uh, we mean all known matter, energy, and space. Right. So we're going to start out with a universe, and then within that universe, we're going to define a subset of space that is our system. And the picture that I like to draw is this. Got a universe, and then I draw my system That. And you know, re really, our universe is you know this. But in drawing it in this fashion, we're really setting off the system a little bit so that we are uh, making clear that the system is distinct from the universe not in the system. So this is the way I like to draw my box. Now, the important thing about this type of drawing, though, is that here we now have a wall that exists between our system and the rest of the universe. And the thing about this wall is that we can control the type of wall that we have. So if we have a wall that is uh, impermeable, uh, rigid, and isolating, then this is a wall that is an isolating wall. Matter does not pass through it. Work cannot be transmitted through it because it's rigid. And heat cannot be conducted through it. We can define other types of walls. For example, we could define a wall that is flexible. insulating and impermeable. And in that case, you know, because it's impermeable, no matter can travel. Because it's insulating, no heat can be conducted. But because it's flexible, 
it's allowed to bow. So you can think of it as kind of almost having a membrane and that membrane can bow in or out. So work can be done. Other walls, rigid, conducting, and impermeable. So this means rigid, no work, conducting. So yes, heat can flow through and impermeable. So no mass can flow. Here we can have a conducting. Flexible, impermeable, wall, which means no mass, yes work, and yes heat. Or lastly, we can have a completely permeable wall. which means that matter can flow in and out. And uh, if you have atoms going back and forth, there's no way that you can prevent them from carrying heat. And there's no way you can pre prevent them from doing work. So these are the, the types of, of walls that we can have. And by taking our system and swapping out different walls, or even if we want to, we could have our uh, system, for example, in, in contact with the universe with, uh, you know, whoops. Let's draw our wall back in here. We could have uh, one wall to do one thing and we could have a uh, different wall to do something else. For example, we could have uh, one wall for heat conduction and one wall for uh, work. Th this allows us to imagine different situations and it makes the math a lot easier because you don't make you know, simple mistakes. Okay, continuing. We say that this system is in a state and this state uh, is defined by a unique set of parameters, which results in that state having a unique set of properties. Now, most of the time when we talk about state, and in this course, most of the time when we talk about it, we're gonna be talking about a macro state. And these macro states are the, you know, macroscopic observable systems and, and the properties they have. And this is, you know, what we're all familiar with. We're familiar with looking at a glass of water and saying, you know, it's a glass of water, it's fluid, or looking at, uh, you know, water that's, that's in the freezer. And you look at that and it's, it's solids. So you say, okay, this water is in the state of being in ice. So it's a solid. But these are the macro, sta macro states. Now, there are also microstates. And a microstate is the atomic or molecular arrangement that yields macroscopic properties.
which is that's our macro state. And for every macro state, there's at least one, but usually more, uh, micro states. You know, for example, you consider the room, right? If you're looking at the room, you know the temperature, you know the pressure, uh, you know the gas composition, and that defines the macro state. It's got a set of, of properties that are unique to this room. But at any one moment, the atoms can be arranged in a different configuration. But for having you know, an astronomical number of ways to arrange the atoms and molecules, that still results in a single macro state that's observable. And the microstates are particularly uh, important when we talk about uh, statistical mechanics, and, and we will uh, touch on that uh, briefly here. Uh, now, all the things that are worth commenting on parameters and, and property choices. If you're looking at the room, you could say, well, what are the parameters that define this room? What are the properties of this room that are important? Well, one important part of this is that these should be relevant. For example, for example, uh, the effect of you know, gravity. Now, I'm sure there are some cases in which gravity is important, but most of the time, the gravity in the room doesn't really play a role in the macroscopic properties. And what's more is that the gravity isn't changing. So it's constant, and we don't have to think about that. But even, even properties and parameters that change, you don't have to think about. For example, the position of the moon relative to the room. We know that you know, the moon is going to be uh, in different places around the Earth. But does that really impact the physical properties of this room? No, no, they don't. And you want to pick a small set I should say the smallest possible set. That are critical for defining the macroscopic uh, state of our system. Um, what's also important is that We're interested in the independent variables. Right? We know that that you know variables can be related to each other. And when we're defining the parameters that we're looking at, we want to pick the smallest possible set that are critical for defining the macro state. And we want to pick a set that are independent of each other. So let's, let's uh, consider an, an example here. Let's consider uh, a single component ideal gas. So a single component ideal gas, we don't have to think about mixing or any uh, interactions uh, associated with, with, does the gas separate out? 
Uh, we also are saying that it's an ideal gas, meaning that it's non-reactive or non-interacting. Okay, whoop. right, a good example of this, you know, might be, uh, you know, one of the noble gases, like, a, a, you know, helium gas uh, under standard temperature and pressure is more or less an ideal gas. So if you're looking at a system, for example, you've got a, a, a balloon with helium gas in it, we can talk about the temperature of the gas. We can talk about the pressure of the gas, and we can talk about the volume of the gas. So you've got, say, pressure, temperature, and volume. So these are whoop, relevant, right? You're, you're looking at this macroscopic uh, gas. But at the same time, we know that these are not independent. Right? We can take the balloon and we can put it under pressure, and that will change the volume and change the temperature. Only two. So, for example, We can pick temperature and pressure. And if we pick temperature and pressure, and we say we can define these to be independent, well, then over here, we have some surface. And this surface is V is a function of pressure and temperature. And we can move around on that surface. So this is gonna bring us to the concept of the equation of state or a state equation. equation of state. And what's special about this is that it uniquely defines the position in this space in terms of our state variables. Now, up here, I said, okay, here are our state variables. And then I said, oh, well, I'll define, I'll define uh, temperature and pressure to be independent, which means I can write V as a function of temperature and pressure. And something that I, I think is important to point out, it, this is certainly true that we could say, oh, V as a function of pressure and temperature is a... Uh, equation of state, but what's more important is that we can move back and forth between these. And what me what comes out of that is that these equations of state are 
can always be written in the form some function of pressure, volume, temperature equal to zero. Or in general terms, we could say some function of uh, whatever our set of state variables are, it can be written as being set equal to zero. So that means that whoop, anytime you have a function of, of this form, we could write volume as a function of temperature and pressure, or we could write temperature as a function of pressure and volume, uh, or pressure and volume and temperature, et cetera. So what else is important about this? What else is important is that it is uh, a single valued surface. And, and by that, I mean by that, I mean that if you're given pressure one and temperature one, this uh, This uniquely defines V1, which is a function of temperature one and pressure one. So it's single valued. Over our temperature and pressure space. And what's more, because it's defined in this fashion, it means that we can transition from V1 to V2, T2, P2, and let's say we're doing this in a uh, quasi-static fashion. So we're moving very, very slowly. So for example, if you're, for example, pushing uh, something across the surface of a table, you're doing it in such a, a slow fashion that there is no friction, uh, then moving from position one to position two, it doesn't matter the path you take. Now, of course, this is, you know, dependent on you taking this very careful transition. And we'll see later that that uh, limits the type of, of uh, activities we're engaged in. But nonetheless, when you're dealing with an equation of state with well-defined state variables, it's possible to move from one state to the next uh, and the path is irrelevant. So let's uh, let's review some math. And this is something that I think everyone 
who is coming to thermodynamics, particularly as an undergrad, uh, the math looks really, really bad, but it's, it's not. And this is all math you've seen before, but the challenge is that when you learn this, which is probably in third semester calculus, uh, is taught from a very math-centric view. And the application doesn't really become apparent. So what we wanna do here is go back and review what you've already learned in third semester calc and, and look at how it can be applied. And what is important, coming back up here, is that we have this definition of a state variable. Because if we go back to third semester calc, we know that if we have a function, of x, y, z, and more, right? It doesn't only have to be three variables, but let's just pick three. If we have some function of x, y, and z, and that function is equal to a constant, for example, zero, but it's equal to some constant, then we can write the total differential of any of these variables. For example, the differential of x is partial of x with respect to y holding z constant dy plus the partial of x with respect to z holding y constant dy. And remember, this partial is uh, differentiating x as a function of y and z. Y. Treating z is just a constant, right? So to remind you, if we have some function of uh, y and z, say uh, y squared z plus z squared, well, d f d y is equal to two y z, you know, plus zero, right? Because our uh, y to the zero here is, is uh, goes to zero. Okay, that's great. And what this means is that in our case, where our state functions might have temperature, pressure, volume, we can say, oh, we got volume in terms of pressure and, and temperature. And we can take, you can say, how does volume change? as temperature and pressure are changed. So we can do that and we can do the same. And I'm not gonna write it out here, but you should also know that also means dy equals dy dx dx dot 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 and dz equals dot dot dot. So You've seen this before. I'm just reminding you. Okay, so we got that. Uh, but wait, there's more. This also means that we can take our partials and we have dz by dx y d x by d z y and they're equal to one. 
I should also comment here briefly that that in these differentials, the little subscript means holding y as a constant uh, or whatever the subscript is. In your calculus class, you don't do that. In thermodynamics, we do it just as a matter of, of uh, remembering uh, what we, we have uh, because we have variables moving back and forth. And as we use them, we want to remember that you know, this can be treated as a uh, function in which y is a constant. So it's just a function of x only. So this might be considered a, a function of x alone. OK, so uh, and again, this is something that math classes, they don't like this because it's, it's kind of, well, it's true, but it's a little bit of an ugly way to do things in, in which you can take these type of derivatives and say, well, you know, I've got this in the top and this in the top, they cancel that and that, they cancel, so it goes to one. It's true, and you can take and formally write out your differentials and you'll see that it all works. Uh, but you should also see that, you know, just looking at this, that these are uh, certainly true as well. Okay, and because we can write this, we can also write dz by dx y is equal to one over d. Whoops, let's erase that. dx by dz y, and there's one more. A uh, handy thing. We have this uh, triple product rule, which tells us that dx by dy z times dy dz x times dz dx y is equal to minus one. And this is pretty useful stuff because uh, now you can do dx by dy z is equal to, whoops, times dz by dx y is equal to minus dz by dy x, etc. A lot of stuff you can do with that. The important thing is that you know that you can uh, multiply these partial derivatives together and if you get three of them together uh, in the right order, so they, they you know, are going to be canceling each other out uh, equal to minus one. So this, this is handy. So going back to our function of pressure, volume, temperature, this means that we have V is equal to partial of V with respect to pressure at constant temperature, dP plus dV by dT, constant pressure, dT. Ta-da. OK. What this also means is that you can integrate this. Right, because if you can take the differential, you should also be able to integrate, right? I think this is one of those fundamental theorems of calculus, if I remember right. Uh, so the implication of this is that 
if I integrate this from V1 to V2 dV, that's going to be the integral of P1 P2 dV dP T dP plus the integral T1 to T2 dB dT P dT. Now, oh, something I want to point out here is that, you know, you're looking at this and you know, you know that these integral integrands are related to dV, right? Well, here the integrand is related to dP. So what is that? Well, that is some function. And it's a function of P, right? Because we're holding T constant, right? This is essentially P1, P2, some function, well, let's call it, change the variable there, let's call this G, P, dP. So when we're writing our uh, total differentials, we're essentially writing out some GP, DP, plus some HT, DT. And these are functions the differentials P and T. What it also means, because you have your volume, then you get your pressure, then you get your temperature, this means that the change in volume independent of the path, right? I mean, whether I put, whether I put uh, pressure first or I put pr uh, temperature first, I still get the same volume. So to continue talking about these, consider that Consider that negative one over V dV by dP at constant temperature. So the change in volume with change in pressure normalized by the volume is equal to beta This is our isothermal compressibility. Right? And similarly, one over V dV by dT P is alpha. This is the isobar, isobaric thermal expansivity. What this means is that if, for example, I can measure my thermal expansivity as a function of temperature, I'll have something like this. I'll have, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like. This 
this set of measurements will allow me to now fill in the value of this function, which means that I now know how the volume changes as a function of temperature. And you know, presumably, I'd have to measure uh, beta as a function of pressure. But I can get all of this information. And whoop, it's basically a matter of making measurements. You can either fit a curve or you know, in a, uh, interpolate. And that will give you all the information you need about the state. So even though in your thermodynamics classes, and this class in particular, you're going to be seeing these equations, and these equations are going to you know, carry with them all of this math. These math, they're just measurable quantities. It's really not as cryptic as it may seem. So when you are in this class and you're looking at these equations and perhaps it's starting to look a little bit overwhelming, just remember you're basically looking at a set of things that you're going to be in real life, you're going to be measuring. And you know our mathematical notation is the shorthand for, for writing it out. So let's continue here. And uh, what is the equation of state for a single component ideal gas? You've seen this before. And you'll see it again and again and again. PV equals NT equals the constant is equal to R is equal to 8.21 times 10 to the minus 2. And very important when you're dealing with this gas constant, is carrying the units. And again, this is something that in thermodynamics, one of the areas that you're going to see the most number of mistakes is in how people manage units. And we'll do the best we can here to, to, to get it right in lecture. But when you're working on your own and you're looking at the textbook, make sure that every time you write something down and extremely important when you plug something into an equation that you're using units that make sense. And uh, I didn't note this here, uh, I will. So this N is the uh, number of moles. Number of moles of gas in the system. Okay, a couple final comments. Uh, as long as we're on this, let's see. Continuing our, our, our discussion of, of definitions. Uh, you can have intensive or extensive variables. Intensive variables are independent of the system size. Extensive is, well, the opposite. So 
So you can think of it as having a, let's say you got a, a two identical systems. You got, and let's say these two systems They have a wall between them and they're identical, meaning they have the same T, P, V, T, P, V. Well, if I take and I get rid of the wall, I have T prime, P prime, V prime. Well, T prime is still equal to T, the temperature didn't change. P prime is still equal to P. The pressure didn't change when I got rid of that wall, but V prime is equal to two V. So this is extensive and these two are intensive. Let's have another thought experiment here. Let's say you've got a system. And I'm going to make my system. So, and I'm going to put an isolating wall. And I'm going to have T1, P, V. T2, PV. So I have the same pressure and volume in each of my two systems, but I have temperatures not equal in the two. Is the system in equilibrium? That's the question. Well, you say, well, will the uh, temperature ever change? Well, as long as we don't move that wall, no, they won't. So, Yes, it, these are in equilibrium, sort of. They're in a local or metastable equilibrium. Because if I take and I wipe out that wall, then the system will spontaneously evolve. Now, you will get to this later, but what I want to point out is that this the spontaneous change, that's essential. And this spontaneous change involves a change in the temperature and the flow of heat. So this is a change in entropy. So uh, kind of this final thought, which I'm not giving it to you now without proof, but what I want you to remember is that if something occurs spontaneously,
then one, it wasn't at equilibrium. And two, when something spontaneously happens, we see, whoop, we see an increase in the entropy. And this will make more sense when we get to the uh, uh, when we get to the second law of thermodynamics. So this is uh, a set of definitions that are important and a review of math uh, that's important for being able to work um, with thermodynamics.